Ladies and gentlemen, a rich episode full of information, an episode with a guest that you have asked for in a loud voice. This is the Citizens TV, so I am proud to play this role for you, on your behalf, but also for personal interest, because we have a great guest, no less than Ricardo Magnani, who is a great speaker. You will find a lot of his material on the internet. He's the one the history loves to, I do not want to say rewrite it, but in short, thoroughly evaluate it in great detail. Welcome, Magnani, on Bio Blue. Thank you very much, Claudio, and good evening to all. Ricardo, I'll call you by name if you don't mind, is a graduate of Bocconi University in Economics and Commerce, but he works in a completely different field. You can see that he's got this calling, this vocation. He left his profession about 13 years ago, and he is now dedicating himself completely to the study and revelation of Leonardo da Vinci. He has also written a book that is entitled, This is Not Leonardo. Did I say it right? Very well. This is not Leonardo, and then he is also dedicated to the study of the discovery of the Americas. He will tell us about his discoveries, intuitions, interesting research. So where do we start from? We start from wherever you want. I guess the whole story in the end is well connected. So let's start with the big picture. Then let's start by resolving the issue from the beginning, in the sense that talking about the discovery of the Americas, which is what I was initially called in for, it's an incorrect statement. Why? Because in fact the Americas were known were inhabited obviously by Native Americans, but most importantly, they were completely mapped out. And this is what I want to show you and prove to you from the beginning in such a way that we immediately remove from the discussion the fact that in America went the Templars, no, the Vikings, no, maybe the Chinese, no, but wait, there is that Roman with the pineapple. Then it was the Romans? The problem is not who went to America first, also because this presupposes an Eurocentric vision. Why do we have to talk about the quote-unquote discovery of the Americas when the Americas were inhabited by people who had astronomical knowledge much more advanced than ours. Are you referring to the Aztecs, those populations? Before them, before the Maya of the 1400s, I speak of the Incas, who are the people who were first visited by those who approached the new continent. So to resolve the issue at its root, I would like to show something logical like we were talking about before, that is the approach I borrowed from being a financial analyst and economist. Logic, in fact, is the most incontrovertible thing that can be used also to analyze this story. How very well I understand you. Thank you. Because I have a scientific background in computer science, then I also did some engineering, and this has served me very well in journalism. Many do not believe it, but when you learn methods of logic, you can apply them somewhere else. Because there are two tricks in the scientific field and in the religious one. They are the postulate and the dogma. They impose something on you and you can't deviate from that. So everything becomes anachronistic according to a date that is fixed randomly. It doesn't make sense. So logic is the one that is more valuable than anything else in analyzing, at least in my case, the material available, which is quite a lot. So talking about the discovery of the Americas, which I repeat, is an incorrect statement. This has been talked about for many years since the map of Piri Rice, for example, in 1513, and then all to look at the city. Yes, but in Piri Rice, there in Brazil, but there is Antarctica perhaps. Let's remember what the Piri Rice map was. Piri Rice is a Turkish admiral. He made this map in 1513, and with a handwritten note, he refers to an infidel named Columbus. Who would have used it, it is said? A similar map, a pilot book, to reach the new world. And then everybody else looks at the Piri Rice map to build all these thematic broadcasts on the mystery. Ah, Piri Rice, the Americas. 
But in reality, mystery does not exist. I always say that. It is a gap often induced by lack of knowledge. Then we develop knowledge, the mysteries will then fall into place, like leaves in autumn. And then we go to see why there is an issue that resolves the situation at its root. There are eloquent images, and we will see later, in which European people in the Americas are witnessed by customs and traditions. In cui una frequenza dei popoli europei nelle Americhe viene testimoniata da, viene testimoniata da usi e costumi, ad esempio. For example, there is an image that I give in direction with Alfonso V of Aragon that has a very particular hairstyle. This is a hairstyle borrowed from a Native American of the Amazon. We have an infinity of these images. Therefore, there is evidence between 1414 to 1459 in which geographic representations or characters, or even plants or animals, are present in most of the paintings and documents of that period. These reveal not only a geographical knowledge, but even a relationship, something that until now has never been analyzed. We stop precisely at the presence of geographical elements that demonstrate that the Americas were known. Let's see what is the mother of all evidence that is Antarctica, the southern land. The southern land is said to be present in all of the maps of the Renaissance. La terra australe. La terra australe si dice che che è presente in tutte le mappe del Rinascimento. With all the jagged coasts. Esatto. Si dice che veniva rappresentata. Exactly. It is said that it was represented in the emulation of Ptolemy, who was the greatest Greek cartographer, Alexandria of Egypt, to give a sense and a balance to the geographical representation and to balance the presence of the continents, Asia, Africa, Europe, with the lower part that did not make sense to leave empty. And then, for a sense of balance, this land Australia was represented. In fact, there are representations by Leonardo then. Representations that denote a widespread knowledge, not only based on cartographers such as Mercator rather than others, which identify the Terra Australis exactly where it should be. There is a map an octant map that was the assumption of what then became a planisphere, not this one, but the previous image, in which Leonardo exactly positions Antarctica between the continents of Asia, correct? Africa and Europe. This is a representation that cannot be just a representation of fantasy or just give a sense of balance of a graphic representation. And if we look at the next image that is a planisphere here in Valtellina and that I trace to Leonardo da Vinci, there is a representation of Antarctica that is very precise. That is, if we see the image perhaps, it helps to understand what I'm telling. It's the one that was aired earlier in an improper way, exactly. On the left side, we see the jagged coast of Antarctica with that kind of peninsula, promontory, that we find precisely under the blanket of ice. What does this tell us? It tells us that there is a geographic knowledge, among other things, a representation without ice, therefore, apparently, anachronistic, that reveals a precise knowledge of the lands that emerged after the flood. Conoscenza puntuale di quelle che erano eh, le terre emerse dopo il diluvio. Perché dico terre emerse dopo il diluvio? Why do I say lands that emerged after the flood? Because there was a representation by Kircher, a Jesuit friar who took up many of Leonardo's works and who makes this representation of the lands that emerged. He said, quote, after the universal flood, unquote. 
Let's say this of the anachronistic things you've said, that the lands that emerged in Antarctica are represented without ice and then with the actual coast, the rocky ones in short, that would now not be visible. So if they had been made after a certain date, no one would have known. And then, if they are correct, and maybe we can check via satellite today, that clearly must be prior to when Antarctica got covered with ice. Esatto, questo infatti è la, la pistola fumante, diciamo, che toglie... Exactly. Eh, This is, in fact, the smoking quelli, gun eh, that, let's say, esatto, removes all those inaccurate statements for which the Americas would have been discovered by. In reality, the Americas, eh, as the whole continent, as the whole planet, was known and mapped ever since. Eh, il fatto che le coste dell'Antartide in questo planisfero come in tanti altri sia The fact that the coast of Antarctica in this planisphere as in many others are free of ice tells us many things one the precision of these representations two the fact that there is no ice at least on the coast which therefore would have allowed one to map this continent. It tells us that there is a cyclicality that the same scientists confirm of the ice ages and temperate ones. This clears away all that. I'm very unfair from the political point of view, so the whole battle of the green economy of Greta Thunberg the warming of the planet, it is actually a cyclicality that over the millennia has always repeated itself. And these maps are justifying that. Why is this analysis important? Because it leads us to understand what happened in the Renaissance, and we see it afterwards, but also because it tells us how, for example, the message that gets transmitted is wrong. It is not a fact of global warming, that is a cyclical fact, it is a problem of pollution, and the pollution that a capitalist system has induced in our daily lives should be addressed in a different way, other than that of global warming. So what may seem to be a theme of such curiosity related to the development of cartography since the discovery of the Americas actually has an undercurrent of truth that leads us to understand the present day. It was Oscar Wilde, if I'm not wrong, who said, only by knowing the past one can in fact interpret events. He was the one who said that by changing the past, you control the present and the future. Exactly. I didn't want to say that. But we will get to that later because actually the big change of interpretations comes at the hands of a political faction of the time. So this reading of the geographical maps of the time, it would be enough to take even those of the 16th century in which Antarctica is still present, or there are coasts of North America, for example, that had not yet been explored and therefore could not be mapped. That removes the question of who first reached the Americas, probably also the Romans and the Vikings, but that's not what we're interested in. What we are interested in is understanding that A, the world was known in its entirety, and there were times when the representations that we have today, including, for example, the Red Sea and the planisphere of Baha'im that fades in color entering the sea, gives us a temporal indication of when these representations had been made because this phenomenon that we see of the Red Sea. Can you explain it for someone who has never seen this map? Leave the image maybe in the background? Most of the images of the maps of the Renaissance show the Red Sea with the red coloring. This one, that is the Erdapfel, which is a world map made by Beheim in 1492 as a copy of a world map made by Paola dal Pozzi Toscanelli, represents the red coloring of the sea fading when it meets the Indian Ocean. What does this mean? It means the coloration is not a decorative coloration, but it corresponds to a phenomenon that is known to be due to a particular algae for which both the Nile and the Red Sea were colored in red. Probably thanks to this coloring, we can also trace back to when these representations were made. It is clear that we are not talking about one or two thousand years ago, because the last deglaciation 
for which the coast of Antarctica could be free from ice was at least 10,000 years ago. This resolves at the root all the situations. Amongst other things, this is very curious because if you have to say with what precision the coasts of Antarctica have been reproduced or if they have been navigated one by one, but since they did not have airplanes, they should have seen it from satellite. It is curious to try to understand how it was possible with the technology that we presume that they had then to be able to build maps above so precisely. Then this opens up so many scenarios that we clearly don't want to look at. We don't want to open, but the question, we simply have to ask it. We said let's reason by logic. So there is a time when the earth was clearly mapped, mapped according to the knowledge that we have about that time, hence done by sextant. So you moved along the coast, little by little. You did the analysis of the measurements of the horizon, the stars, and gave references that now with any satellite are much more immediate. It is clear that it is not possible that it was mapped in that way. So I repeat, this triggers a whole series of questions that perhaps can be investigated later. But right now, what we have interest in is that in the Greek world, hence Ptolemy, there was a knowledge that was transferred to the Renaissance world, especially in Florence with Manuel Crai Solares, that was a Greek present in Florence at the beginning of the 15th century, who was stationed in Hungary, who was then transferred to the Renaissance world, then to the Americas. But I repeat, not to discover them because there was a decidedly prior knowledge, and all these images are proving it. So let's resolve the question of who discovered what, even because it's ugly. No, there is this intellectual prevarication of the Eurocentric world that says we discovered those, and Europe, from their point of view, when was it discovered? So it's really an error of method, since that is what we are using. And then there were so many similar construction techniques between the Central Americas and, for example, Egypt and the ancient Egyptians, when they made those canoes with the same exact construction technique. But I think it was Lake Titicaca they made very smaller. Still today, they make them smaller, but identical to those made by the pharaohs. You've said a beautiful thing, that is, let's get out of here for a moment and enter into my field, Leonardo. Because it is said that Leonardo's ferry was invented by him. It's not true. It's not true at all. There were six stations on Lake Lario, not Lake Como, where this ferry was used. There were some on the Tenaro, some on the Ticino. In fact, there are these double boats that were used on Lake Titicaca. There is a doubt I have always had. Leonardo certainly did not invent the ferry that is attributed to him. He only drew what he saw most of the time. My impression is, in the light of everything we are going to say today, is that there has been such a transfer of knowledge from the new world to the old world that even this type of boat may have been borrowed, like the hairstyle we saw earlier, but also many other things. We are in Milan. We say about Lombardi, the Lazaretto of Manzonia in memory, coming from Leco de Bertrothed, is a must, is in fact the repetition of the ceremonial square for the Intiraimi, therefore the solar cult. The whole Florentine Renaissance movement, based on the knowledge brought by Gemistis Plesto, was based on the solar cult that Gemistis Plesto said would have reset the religious wars between Muslims and Catholics, etc. So there are a whole series of elements and evidence, as we said before, that testify a very strong connection between these two worlds, even a peaceful one, compared to the one that developed later, and we will see later with other images. Pacifica eh, rispetto a quella che poi si è sviluppata e lo vedremo in, in seguito con altre immagini. Bene, allora, il tuo libro è qua, peraltro. Io well, then, your book, which I did not show before, this is not Leonardo. Here it is. 
What do you want to tell us? What does this title mean? Allora, questo titolo è, è nato sul suggerimento di un caro amico che è Stefano Trevisi, che poi mi ha fatto la prefazione. Well, this title was born from the suggestion of a dear friend of mine, Stefano Trevisi, who wrote the preface and who is a musician and with whom we will talk about music because nobody knows, but the most important part of Leonardo's legacy is music. And it is an evocation of Magritte's Cece ne pa un peep. So there is this representation of Magritte that we wanted to clearly recall, presenting an untrue image of Leonardo, as most of the ones that have been used are. Last year there were celebrations for the 500th anniversary of his death, and everyone was using these stereotypical images of a bearded old man wearing a painter's hat. Actually, this is the portrait of a musician that portrays Leonardo just in his function as a musician. And so I wanted to give this sense of unreality to the image of Leonardo that has been told by asking a friend of mine to redo this, that is, Salvatore Vara. This image with Leonardo with the pipe and then recall Magritte and recall etc. The book obviously speaks also of the question of the Americas, for that underlies all the Renaissance movement and strongly conditions the life of Leonardo as well. We know that he came to Milan in 1482. In reality, Leonardo probably arrived in 1449. This declaration will make many people turn up their noses because they say he was born in 1452. But in reality, Leonardo was born 10 years earlier. He is not linked to the notary in Vinci, but he is linked to one of the most important families of the Renaissance, and therefore, when the conspiracy of the Pazzi is hatched, in order to take possession of the territories in the new continent, Leonardo comes to Milan for the second time. The second time, because even in the documents, for example, Vasari or the anonymous Gadiano, they write that Leonardo is in Milan at the time of Francesco Sforza. Francesco Forza dies in 1465. Then, combining logic and documentation, that is the maximum when the two combine. At some point, giving undeniable evidence, even if those who live on dogmas and postulates then question that too. So it is a reinterpretation of Leonardo's biography, of the meaning that all the works then have within the Renaissance context. For example, this way, I can arouse your curiosity and we can go a bit off track. The Gioconda, the portrait of Lisa Gerardini, is not the one exhibited at the Louvre. Great, I went last year, so I lost some time. Fantastic. And in the book, I explain why it is not. But let's go back to the talk of the Americas. Otherwise, go, go, so we finish up one step at a time. An image, therefore, to solve the question of knowledge prior to the modern era, there is a representation of Pompeii that I recently discovered of Zeus. At the feet of Zeus, there is a globe that depicts the Red Sea in the upper left part and therefore identifies a strange portion of the world. It would be necessary to understand why there is a vision of the planet because usually they tend to center it on something known. But I wanted to put this out there because it solves another question. Let me see it again, please. Let's expose it for a bit. And in this way, we can also satisfy the flat earther. But there is that sort of yellow circle on the top left. What is that? It identifies a red sea. That is the circle that you have made to identify the red sea that is red in color. So what we see in the center could be Madagascar, or a representation, since it is also apparently white, but then we would have to see the painting in its state of preservation, etc. Then there is another curious thing, that this is spherical. Is it a spherical earth? Evidently, yes. Globe. And was the earth ever known to be a globe at that time? Because the history doesn't speak of... No, eh, we know that Eratosthenes calculated the circumference of the Earth, so the question is actually ill-posed. If we knew that there was Antarctica, and that Antarctica had a well-defined shape, it goes without saying that they knew the fact that the Earth was round.
and about flat Earth, what did you mean? No, che questo è un mappamondo. That this is a globe, and I mean evidently the knowledge is ancestral that the Earth is not flat. La Terra non è piatta. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. On this, we can say that it was obvious. No, però appunto vedi che la curiosità è venuta, no? Come a Pompei conoscevano. In realtà perché? Then no, but you see that curiosity aroused. How did they know in Pompeii? In reality, because there was a widespread knowledge of roundness. So once we solve these issues, it is instead important to understand what revolves around the alleged discovery of the Americas. That is, what happened in the 15th century, which is very relevant to what we experience on a daily basis, i.e., the use of all the museums or cities of art, Italian in the first place, but also to what we experience on a daily basis, i.e., the society in which we live today is deeply rooted and founded on what happened in the 15th century. There is a date that is worth more than any other date, and that is 1459. To make you understand the importance of the Americas issue, the watershed between the Middle Ages and the Renaissance is the discovery of the Americas. So from 1492 onwards, we start the Renaissance. In truth, the Renaissance is based on the acquaintances formed in Florence during the Council of 1438 through the Byzantine dignitaries, through Gemistus Pletho, through the introduction of texts that came from the Greek and Byzantine world. And therefore, there has been this revival of the arts. And therefore, there has been this revival of the arts, astronomy, music, geometry, mathematics. This watershed in truth is not 1492, but rather 1459. In 1459, the Renaissance does not begin, but it ends. To attribute the beginning of the Renaissance to 1492 is a macroscopic error because it means Marsilio Ficino, Pico and Mirandola Botticelli, Leonardo were all medieval men. The Botticelli's birth of Venus, the absolute icon of the Renaissance movement, would have been medieval. Among other things, we will see that it also has to do with the issue of the Americas. So 1459 is an important date precisely because it marks the end of the Renaissance and instead takes over those missions of hypocrisy and subtraction of knowledge for which we come to acquire a completely different history. Uh, acquisire una storia completamente diversa. What exactly happens in 1459? Two things. On the one hand, there is in Florence the Cavalcade of the Magi inside the Palace of Medici Riccardi, residents of the Medici family, and on the other hand, Pio II, Pope Enea Piccolomini, newly elected, who announces the Council of Mantova to seek alliances and face the Turks who were pushing. They had taken Constantinople and therefore risked putting in danger the Catholic movement. On the other hand, the Cavalcade of the Magi instead tells the manifesto of political alliances of the time, the Medici, the Sforza, d'Este, Maltestesta, all of those who opposed the Roman power of the Vatican si contrapponevano al potere eh, romano del Vaticano. E perché è così importante? Perché And why is it so important? Because all the families that we have cited are holders of a representation of the Americas before 1492. And we speak of 1450 roughly. So this shows that there was a widespread knowledge of these things. Even in this representation, that I do not know if it has been shown, I have not seen it, the Chapel of the Magi in reality. Let's see if it is this one. It is said that the procession was led by Matthias, sorry, Lorenzo the Magnificent, in an unreal representation that presented him as more handsome than he actually was. He had a squashed nose as he was hit by a truck. But in reality, the procession was led by Matthias Corvinus. Why Matthias Corvinus? Because it is not the Cavalcade of the Magi, but of the Magyars, one of those seven tribes that completed to form the Hungarian people. Newly elected to the royal throne and accompanied, this is the comparison. On the left, we find Matthias Corvinus, on the right, 
Lorenzo di Medici, who are completely different. This representation is important because it connects the Hungarian world with the events of the Americas to the point that the attribution of the name quote-unquote Americas has nothing to do with Amerigo Vespucci, who appears only because something happens that makes history change, of course, and then the paternity of the name is attributed to him, Amerigo Vespucci. La, la paternità del nome, ma in realtà è Emmerich che era il figlio di Stefano I. But in reality it is Emmerich, the son of Stephen I, who was the first Catholic Hungarian king. So the Hungarians had a fundamental role in the attribution of the name quote-unquote Americas. Also, this is not a minor detail, because if we think today, the cradle of civilization is Greece. All our knowledge comes from the Byzantium, however, from the Middle Eastern world. The knowledge of the Americas was strongly related to the Hungarian people. Draw a line and you will see today where Greece lies, where Hungary lies, where the Middle East lies. They have all been completely superseded. So not only has it been emptied of the knowledge, but it has also been emptied of a political personality. And this is not accidental, as we will see later. Personalità eh, politica e questo non è casuale, eh, come vedremo poi. Allora, dicevo. So I was saying the story of the discovery of the America was changed by the papacy. There is an image that will be shown in a moment that compares Innocent the Eighth, who is the Pope who died before Columbus arrived in the Americas, in the official reconstruction, which is this one. And on the left, there is a portrait of Columbus done by Ghirlandaio. They are the same person. E a sinistra troviamo un ritratto di Colombo fatto dal ghirlandaio. Sono la stessa persona. Questo perché è intervenuto? Perché Why did he enter the scene? Because as I was saying, when the Medici, the Sforza and the Hungarians went to the Americas, they went there with an extremely peaceful spirit. So much so that at the Chapel of the Magi, the Patripatria of the Medici family, and therefore Cosimo di Medici is not portrayed following Matthias Corvinus, but is depicted in a corner. How? Dressed as a Native American. Not only dressed as a Native American, but also dressed as the Inca chief, Paca Hutek, who died in 1459. And this seems to be a tribute to the Pater Patria that he is paying to the person of the new world, the highest in the priestly and royal hierarchy. Quello che indossa, al di là della capigliatura, che è la stessa che viene riproposta, abbiamo già visto un paio di What he wears beyond the hairstyle that we have already seen coming up a couple of more times, the important thing here is what he has on his head. That is the Mascai Pacha. The Mascai Pacha was an ornament made of gold filaments and three feathers of a sacred bird that represented the conjunction between the material world and the etheric world, and therefore it is the same meaning as the chaperon, which so much so that it is improperly said that this trip to the Americas will become the venture of Cosimo di Medici. But in reality, we have an antecedent image that concerns a plate that was made by the brother of Masaccio to celebrate the birth of Lorenzo the Magnificent in which this venture appears. But it also appears here in the middle of the 15th century. I'm talking about Gravedona on the upper lake. I'm talking about other places that were connected to that political manifesto I referred to earlier. So of the Americas and this alliance is made very, very evident documentate e documentali per cui la conoscenza delle Americhe e l'evidenza di questa And here other anomalies come into play. It's said to be documented only what is written because an image can't be altered while the words can in fact be changed. It's the opposition between quadrivium and the trivium, rhetoric, dialectic and grammar. With those, you change the meaning of everything, but the image does not have mediation. This is of the Mascai Pacha, and all the rest identifies some knowledge, as I have said, not only geographical, but also direct and peaceful between a political alignment and the new world. So much so that the old world borrows a series of behaviors from the new world 
As the Maskai Pacha, the hairstyles, the ceremonial square, the solar cult above all, and so much more. So from what I understand, there was a whole political faction made up of these great families that already knew the Americas, and not only that, already had cultural relations to the point that there were some paintings that portrayed them with Native American headgear. So this should have been already established. Not only that, and it was a peaceful relationship, as you say. It was very peaceful, so much so that the two most powerful families of the time, the Sforza and the Medici, actually put out a mestizo at the head of their dynasty. Lorenzo the Magnificent and Ludovico il Moro, known as il Moro because of the skin tone, as Paolo Giovio testifies to, were the mestizos. They were children of the first voyages to the Americas. This shows how there was a total mixture between the two populations, a peaceful relation that is then overturned by the other faction linked to the papacy of Pius II onwards, for which, a little for the presence, as we have said before the Turks, a little for the deep riches that were in the New World, and also for the possibility of not only colonizing, but also indoctrinating the new populations to the Catholic cult, there was a total reversal. There was a subtraction of this discovery. This subtraction of discovery is denounced in the paintings, again, of the Renaissance. And here later we will get to Ferragini, the Italian influencer. But that painting where you saw the Pope and Christopher Columbus, do you want me to explain it? If you can find it then, because it is very curious. The image on the right is the image of Pope Innocent VIII, who died in August 1492. And it is the statue that presides over the tomb of Innocent VIII in the Vatican. La statua che presiede la tomba di Innocenzo VIII in Vaticano. Which one is it? This one on the right. On the right, the esatto. dark one. Sotto la sua statua, di questo ne ha parlato Ruggero. Under his statue, which Ruggero Marini spoke of, he is, however, very entangled in the connection of Columbus and the papacy, etc. Under his image, there is written, quote, he who discovered the new world, unquote. But the new world, hence Columbus, was still to come. The one on the left that you have seen, and to which I have put the papal tiara, is the image of Christopher Columbus made by Ghirlandaio a few years earlier. They are of the same person. Of these images in the book, there are two or three others. There are images under the so-called Madonna of the Navigators, the Madonna of Mercy, with the open veil that recalls the heart of the shape, the shape with which the first planispheres were created. And it is a logical image again. If you take a sphere and open it, what comes out is a heart image that was then the frame of all geographical representations. Listen, and the fact that that statue on the right, it looked like it had dark skin, in reality has nothing to do with it. That is a material construction matter, and that is all. Exactly. Yes, yes. The connections between mestizos and the old continent are others. And how do you explain that they were the same person? Adesso te lo vengo a dire. Bye. Allora, dicevo, ci sono tantissime rappresentazioni. Now I'm going to tell you. So I was saying there are so many representations that show a knowledge of the new world, flowers, plants, etc. Today is the celebration of Mary Magdalene. So there is the Beato Angelico that in the representation of Nodi Mi Tangeri represents Jesus with Mary Magdalene and tells him, do not touch me, to avoid the end that Orpheus did with Oridice. In reality, it is a myth that predates Jesus and Christ because of the opposition between the material world and the etheric world. Christ ascends and does not need to be touched by materiality or, like Orpheus, loses the possibility to realize the spiritual marriage, etc. 
The Dominicans are very important because they underlie the whole story of the Americas and the convent of San Marco in particular. In that representation, there is a representation of a flower. There is a particular, the next image, that we find also of the Malatesta Temple of Rimini. We find in the Malatesta Petiol, we find on a shield of Native American that in the Codex Florentini in Florence, it is a flower called Ludwigia, Peruviana. It is an octetonous flower of the Americas, which is four petals with an insert of green. If we show the image of the petiole on the coin, maybe the comparison becomes more obvious. So as I said, the evidence are many. At a certain point, what happens? It happens that the church takes possession of all these discoveries by putting in the first place all a series of bloody events. The conspiracy of the Pazzi, the killing of Galeazzo Sforza, here in Milan, the killing of Simonetta Cataneo Vespucci. That was the model that Botticelli used to represent the Americas in his paintings. Cataneo Vespucci, che è la modella che utilizza Botticelli per rappresentare le Americhe nei suoi dipinti. Ma soprattutto c'è un ciclo di dipinti. But above all, there is a cycle of paintings made by Botticelli that forms the story of Nastagio degli Onesti, a Boccaccio story in which Botticelli paints the Venus, hence. Simonetta Cataneo Vespucci, on the ground, wounded in the back with a dagger. That is the representation that calls the way in which Giuliano de' Medici was killed in 1478 in the Cathedral of Florence with the help of Piero de Guti's daughter, Bianco de' Medici, married to a Pazzi. La figlia di Piero Gottoso, Bianca de' Medici, sposata a un Pazzi. E, esatto, questa immagine. Correct, this image. And in the part of the foliage, above the scene of Giuliano, rushing to the aid of Simonetta Catiano Vespucci, wounded in the back, you can see a kind of passage that references the passage through Panama. This is probably because the first voyages to the Americas were going the east way, and therefore the first approach is through the Atlantic Ocean. Sorry, the Pacific, not the Atlantic. E quindi il primo approccio è attraverso l'Oceano Atlantico e è Pacifico e non Atlantico. Il passaggio sull'Oceano The passage on the Atlantic Ocean is suggested later on by Paolo Dal Pochi Toscanelli, who leaves a description to a Portuguese canon, Martinez, and makes a description for his king, then for the king of Portugal, in which he says to give up the way from Guinea because there is a much more direct way traveling west to reach the coast of the New World where the houses are covered with gold. Clearly we talk about the myth of El Dorado, etc. Then, if you want, we will also talk about El Dorado. In the next image, always in this cycle by Botticelli, there is the Lady of Mali. That is a reference to that old way to Guinea. Un rimando a quella vecchia via verso la Guinea. What is the protrusion that looks like a woman and therefore correct? So what happens? The church intervenes. Let me get this straight then. Over here is the Botticelli painting, and over here, where is this mountain? You see it? It's in Guinea. It's called Lady of Mali, and it's one of the places where the expeditions to the New World started from. That's what I was missing. Perché è così importante? Sorry, before you said why is it so important the issue about Innocent the Eighth and why this double personality? Because there is a painting. I'm shuffling the cards a little bit, but the director has been very good. Esiste un dipinto? Sto cambiando un po' le carte in tavola. I ragazzi in regia sono bravissimi. Esiste un dipinto del 1451. There is a painting from 1451 by Piero della Francesca in which there is a representation, not precise, more, of North America and the Gulf of Mexico with Yucatan, this one, with de Yucatan, Florida, on the bottom, under the muzzle of the white dog, is Cuba. 
The black and white dogs represent the order of the Dominicans that underlie, as I said before, the events of the Americas. Okay. Okay, this same representation. No, first I want to tell you a particular detail. It's crazy. Piero, 1451. This is impressive. Because you can even see that. There is a lake that has an unpronounceable name in Florida that can be recognized. There is another very small lake above Florida that bears my wife's name, Marion. And this is just crazy because between everything you can recognize. But then there is always my big doubt. How do you make such a realistic map if you don't have the visibility from above? Because it's okay that one goes back and forth and measures steps. I don't know. But how do you do it? I mean, you can do it in broad terms, but not... Correct. That's why I wanted to solve it out at the root with Antarctica. Because that cuts the bull's head off. In the sense that any doubt you might have about these representations, you solve it at the root with that other representation. But on the subject, why did I let you have this painting? Because Piero La Francesca painted it in 1451, when in the pseudo-historical reconstruction Columbus was born. Do you know when Piero de la Francesca died? October 12, 1492, which is not a date by chance. Appreciate the fact that I'm not swearing here. October 12, 1492 is important because there is another painting by Pisanello, the vision of Saint Eustace, in which a character, which I recognize to be Domenico Malatesta, this one, has in front of him, under the deer, a vision of South America. So, Saint Eustace is seeing South America. Again, the dogs appear, recalling the Dominicans, but in the Roman martyrology. Then always from the east, so this also comes back. Correct. In the Roman martyrology, Saint Eustace is today celebrated on the 30th of September. But before 1492, according to the Golden Legend by Jacopo di Barazze, Saint Estuace is celebrated when? No, I don't want to say that. October 12th. So what happens? It happens that the story of the Americas that we know is attributed to Christopher Columbus actually in fact begins to take on a whole series of elements that are recurrent in the initial events of the first trips to the Americas. There is another important document, and so we close the circle on the documents. This is the Hesperus of Basilio di Parma. Basilio di Parma writes this set of poems to celebrate Pandolfo Sigimondo Malatesta, the loser. Ezra Pound defines him the best loser in all of history. In reality, he is a loser who takes on a whole series of actions in order to reassemble the dominant role of Domenico Malatesta, who is clearly a humanist, etc. In the Hesperus of Basilio da Farma, the military deeds of Pandolfo Sigismondo are narrated. But at a certain point, some images appear, four, in which Pandolfo Sigismondo leaves a caravel, shipwrecks, arrives on the lucky island, and there he stops in the temple of Zephyr with the beloved Isota. Nel tempio di Zefiro con l'amata Isotta. Stiamo parlando dell'isola di San Salvador. We are talking about the island of San Salvador, where Columbus will shipwreck. So you can understand that the story of Columbus is a totally invented story using true elements of the first excursions to the Americas, clearly made by the opposite faction. And in order to avoid the claiming of this faction as a primogenitor, what gets done? Inquisitions. The Inquisitions are supported to, first, protect the Catholic foundation against Neoplatonism, which is the real obstacle to the spread of Catholicism in the 15th century. But above all, they are made to protect this farce of the discovery of the Americas. Questa farsa della scoperta dell'America. 
At a certain point, you say there is someone in the Catholic world who says, now we're going to attribute the discovery of the Americas because it's no good if we give too much political power to another faction. And so how do we discover the Americas? Well, let's see what we know about the Americas. They go and get all the elements, paintings, the maps, the tales, etc., and decide to invent a story, to take ownership. Yes, a story, because if you talk about a shipwreck, then, I mean, and the whole story of Nina La Pinta and Santa Maria and all the things that we are taught in school. Allora, Nina Pinta e Santa sono le tre figlie di Piero il Gottoso. Che sono so, Nina Pinta and Santa are the three daughters of Piero the Guti who are represented in the Chapel of the Magi. Then, where Cosimo di Medici wears the Mascai Pacha in three different positions. They almost seem to navigate in the cycle of frescoes that there is on three sides with the Masca Pacha on their head, changing clothes and using exotic ones. Then the three daughters are called Lucrezia, Bianca and Maria. Maria was adopted, hence Santa. Lucrezia was nicknamed Nanina, Nina. So there is a strong, I had also found a document that certifies that the nickname of the three daughters was Nina, Pinta because painted by Botticelli and Santa just because she was adopted, but I can no longer find it. But it seems that the name of the three caravels is in fact, was the name of the three daughters of Piero the Guti, and therefore it further justifies an element of those first trips that that was then used. Do you want to know where the mass of the caravels that have returned are in fact? Because as you know, one was shipwrecked and two returned in the Cathedral of Siena. There are two masks that are associated with a 13th century carriage. In reality, they are the two masks of two caravels. It is presumable to think that they are the mass of the caravels that have returned. Earlier an image appeared that, but excuse me, then did the caravels leave or not? What I can't understand, if Christopher Columbus is an invention, what kind of journey is that? Ah, a real journey made before by someone else. Exactly. Whoever built the tale of Christopher Columbus built it on the basis of what happened before. I was telling you the inquisitions were done to protect the Catholic foundation, but they are made by four states, the Vatican, the Germans, the Portuguese, and the Spanish. It happens to be the four states affected by the events of the discovery of the Americas. There is at the Piccolomini library a portion of a painting by Pinturicchio that shows the moment when Enea Piccolomini, then Pope Pio II, introduced to Federico III of Germany, the last emperor of the Sacred Roman Empire, Eleonora of Portugal. Behind them, this one. Behind them, who is there? The one dressed in black with the cross, Nastagio Vespucci. Here is born that plot through which to abduct the truth of the discovery of the Americas. That is Americo Vespucci's grandfather, Nastagio Vespucci. That is why Botticelli made those four paintings with which to denounce the abduction of the truth of the discovery of the Americas, referring to the Boccaccio novel Nastagio degli Onesti. So there is a plot that I am obviously synthesizing for editorial purposes, for space. Quindi c'è una trama che ovviamente io sto sintetizzando per necessità certo. di, di editoriali, di spazio. Also because the hour we have available is running out. Però sono veramente tanti gli elementi che ci lasciano capire come la storia della scoperta dell'America di However, there are many elements that allow us to understand how the story of the discovery of the Americas is in fact a total fiction invented by the church at the expense of those who actually had first access to the Americas in order to develop the change that is still taking place today. I have told you many times that the Dominicans are at the base of the whole movement. After the Columbus tale, the Dominicans became the Jesuits, who did not exist before. Jesuits that we still find today in the double pope without function and everything revolves around this. Monte di Paschi di Siena, 1472. Banco Mediceo ended. So banking, a certain kind of trade, above all, is a total virtuality. There is a very important phrase that Leonardo said that I always repeat, quote, nothing can be loved or hated without full knowledge of it, unquote. 
Without knowledge, you do not get to understand what is actually going on. That's why it is so important to approach these subjects precisely, developing a critical sense, something that today our society has completely lost. I got angry. I burn your next question about the story of the influencer of the Uffizi because it's like bringing young kids into the spider's web. You don't take an influencer to bring young people to the Uffizi. You explain to the young people the true course of history, the true meaning behind the works. Showing an influencer in front of Botticelli's Venus makes no sense if you don't explain that the veils that Botticelli's Venus is dressed in are a representation of North America and South America. Alla Venere di Botticelli non ha nessun senso se non spieghi che i veli con cui la Venere di Botticelli è vestita sono una rappresentazione dell'America del Nord e dell'America del Sud. Il dipinto più iconico. The most iconic painting from the Renaissance and the Uffizi that we see, the red veils are a representation of North America and South America, as represented by Malton Wadsimuller in 1507 in the first cartographic representation in which the name, quote unquote, Americas appears, that is already a part of the mystification of history that has built step by step through all these actions. Costruita passo passo. Listen, and then what happens? The story is built, your reconstruction, and then from there begins the persecution of the people of South America. That is, the various exterminations, the appropriations, because you tell me that before. They were peaceful. So that story can also be, and has functioned, let's say by justification, to say, well, now it is ours because we have discovered it, now we take it. Well, my university teacher would have given you an 8 for the use of the verb function, which was a must. That is, you were questioned. All you had to do was say, quote unquote, function, and you won. But that's how it is. As I said, the Renaissance ends in 1459, and then the great mystification starts. The church, the Portuguese, the Spanish, what do they do? They take legal possession of the New World, also through a series of papal bulls and through the Treaty of Tordesillas in 1494. And then everything takes on a different meaning. Clearly with the extermination of the local population because they had gold and they took it away from them. There is, in the Cathedral of Seville, a statue behind the altar made with gold stolen from the Native Americans. It's two and a half tons. It's a lot. It's impressive. Two and a half tons. It completely erases whatever cultural reference they had. Solar worship. The Catholic creed is forcibly imposed upon them. Today, most of South America is in fact Catholic. It is a conquest for all intents and purposes. It is an abuse of power. The military conquests are always an abuse, let's say. Therefore, the course of history has been profoundly changed. One wonders what would have happened if the other political faction had gone ahead under a cultural profile, under a political profile, under an economic profile. In your opinion, what cultural heirs does that other faction have today? Those who operate in the underworld, like us, in the sense that there is a deep-rootedness of Neoplatonic cult made of knowledge related to natural law, but it is almost difficult to externalize because it is branded as conspiracy. Among other things, a conspirator is someone who plots, someone who reveals. The conspiracy with this hunt for fake news could be a reinterpretation of the Holy Inquisition. Correct, right? That's why I continue to argue that everything was born in the development of the 15th century. Because at some point, as it did not at the time of the Alexandrian Library or the various councils that developed, what does the church do? The people demand knowledge, the church gives knowledge. It burns all the sources and then gives drugged knowledge. Let me say one thing about Leonardo, and then we will eventually do other meetings on Leonardo. 
We were accustomed to thinking that he was born the son of a notary in Vinci in 1452 because that narrative is written by Vasari, who is considered the official biographer of Leonardo in The Lives, quote unquote. In reality, there are two versions of The Lives, one dated 1568, written with the privilege and license of Pio V, who happened to be the inventor and institutor of the Index Laborum Prohibitorum, and therefore the censorship, and an antecedent dated back to 1550, in which Leonardo is the nephew of the notary in Vinci, who was a good uncle and relative helping him in his youth, and his mother was not even a slave. Quote, because for the mother is born of good blood, unquote. This about Leonardo, but Leonardo is a sort of litmus paper to tell what happens, is the change, the mystification of the documentation, which then changes the course of history. We have seen it with the Americas. So much evidence. October 12th, the landing, the shipwreck on the island of Antila, Santo Domingo. The church takes possession and distorts the course of history and meaning in such a way as to build a completely fictitious reality. Today, we live completely in a fictitious world full of fake news. That's why I say our genesis develops there. Che la nostra genesi si sviluppa nel quindicesimo. Senti, però oggi in realtà la Chiesa è in difficoltà. Listen, however, today, in reality, the Church is in difficulty because of its values, those that it has handed down over the centuries, or that can be recognized. The value of the family, the same clear belief in a higher God, etc., are continually challenged and dismantled by what is now clearly the neoliberal horde that pursues different goals such as the dismemberment of individuals, etc. So can the polarities be inverted or are there more complex logics within factions against factions? Yes and no. Which church are you talking about? That of the religious cultural foundation or that which has temporal power? Because the church possesses both. It is no accident that I mentioned Jesuits and today's Pope is in fact a Jesuit. And many of those who have helped to lead Italy in recent years come from the Jesuit school. Prodi, Monti, etc. That are the heirs of the Dominicans you were saying? They take over from the Dominicans. Once that there is America's discovery, the Dominicans are completely supplanted. The Dominicans had the cartographic knowledge of the Americas, but they did not have that business-like nature that the Jesuits did, which instead transformed into a sort of relic of the Dominican order that becomes the business-minded. That's why I was questioning what you were saying. Is it true that in terms of recourse to faith, family values, the church is being completely emptied? But in terms of economic and social and political control, the church is stronger than ever, really stronger than ever, since Wojtyla, Pope John Paul II. And it is not a coincidence, perhaps, that today the Pope, who is then to be seen if he has or has not the title of Pope, but at this moment in the chair is a Jesuit. Ma in in questo momento in in cattedra è è un Jesuita. Why do you say it is to be seen if he is Pope or not? Because of the double election with Ratzinger? Because Ratzinger is living, and because in the Jesuit oath there is a full fidelity to the Pope. In fact, if you notice that as soon as he was elected to the papal throne, what Pope Bergoglio say? What did he say? Quote, I thank the leaving bishop, unquote. He did not thank the Pope, and he never recognizes Ratzinger in the role of Pope because otherwise he would owe him obedience according to the oath he took as a Jesuit. And so then a whole series of things are triggered here that I honestly have no interest in developing. So we had an hour of talk and we completely rewrote history, a little bit. I knew it would have been a very interesting chat with a lot of documents, and so I thank the citizens who pointed out Riccardo Magnani to us so that he could come to the Citizens TV. But since I suspect, also, from the voluminousness of your books, 
that there are many other things that we have not said, and probably this is only the tip of the pyramid. I am already booking for a second part in September. Very, very willingly. In which we could go on about the analysis of these very fascinating themes, and I imagine that your research, your theses are, will not be seen well everywhere, if I may say so. Many enemies, much honor, someone said. Unfortunately, it's part of the role, in the sense that you know when you are telling something different from the commonly perceived foundation, you find criticism and you find support. It's never easy to put things in order. Before you put things in order, you have to make a mess. If you make a mess, your wife will come and she'll criticize you for making a mess. And it's what's happening here. But it's part of the game. There's one thing that drives me in a very strong way. First of all, a love for knowledge, which is a very subjective thing, but also because I believe that each of us must do something to ensure that young people have a different future than the one we're giving them. And this is the way I can do it, or this is the way I know how to do it. And this thing is stronger than any attack I can receive. So I go forward undaunted. All right, thank you, Ricardo Magnani. It has been a pleasure having you as a guest here on bioblue.com and on television on Devero TV. We remember your book, Ricardo Magnani. This is not Leonardo. I will read it with great pleasure because you have written a beautiful dedication. Thank you. My habit is to always ask for dedications from guests. I remind you that we are finally, we are actually experimenting, but you can find many things on Digital Terrestrial Channel 606 for Lombardy, 632 in Lazio. If every now and then strange things happen, don't worry. It's me who fiddles, but from September, we will surely perfect like an army. We need to sustain all these costs. We also need to expand because we don't want to limit ourselves to Lombardy and Lazio, but we want to move at military pace towards all other regions to give an alternative way of thinking, which to me always seems to be a useful thing at the end. No? There are also apps, Devero TV. Look for them on your devices. If you want to support us, you can do it with a small subscription of only three coffees per month. Go.bioblue.com forward slash abonati, A-B-B-O-N-A-T-I or with a donation that never hurts, the economic gift. At the end of the day, I always say, if we were on private networks, we would have mega billionaire advertisers who usually have different interests than those from the citizens. If we were on public television, we would have money from taxes. We are the television of the citizens. We don't even have advertising. But on the television of the citizens, the editors are the citizens, and therefore we ask the citizens to support us. This is the reason to remain free. Thank you and goodbye.